So what I'm hoping that we're going to accomplish then over the course of today is uh, really the big thing is to try to understand what it means to measure pain. And in fact, the first hour, you may find, boy, it's actually a little bit silly to kind of measure pain in a way. Um, so we're going to appreciate the relative merits and, of course, the relative limitations of doing so. Uh, I hope we're going to spend some time talking about the numeric pain rating scale. You think, wow, really? That's like the easiest scale you could possibly think of. Probably true, but it's also the single most popular clinical tool in the world um, as far as standardized measurement tools go. I mean, after height and weight and blood pressure and all that sort of thing, but in terms of self-report tools. And yet, I'm guessing that most of us have spent very little time actually talking about the numeric rating scale and what it can do and what it means. <coughs> We're then going to talk about the added value uh, that can be gained from looking at other aspects of the pain experience, so frequency, quality, location, and how we can do that. We're going, to, we're going to understand and apply a few new, new uh, frameworks for assessment and prognosis, some things that I've come up with over the years and things that others have come up with that I'm going to share with you. Uh, we're going to talk about when and how to capture and administer uh, tools trying to tap the more sort of cognitive or psychological domain. And, uh, and then we're going to talk as well about the idea of quantitative sensory testing and what that means and how we can add to our understanding of pain. What I'm hoping is that this may be the first in perhaps a series of, of these types of workshops that um, I, I truly believe that good treatment starts with good assessment. And so it really would have been putting the cart before the horse to jump into a pain treatment or pain management workshop. We need to first try and understand what's happening with our patient. And usually you'll find that good assessment directly leads in to good treatment if you've done it properly. So that's why I wanted to start with assessment. It also happens to be probably the area, I guess, closest to my, to my heart. Um, I, I fancy myself a bit of a clinometrician, uh, which means I like to look at these rating scales and do all sorts of analyses on them and determine the properties of them and that sort of thing. So this kind of fits uh, really well with that. All right, I'm going to start with, with this little exercise. This is the new Cassidy Walton. We just moved two weeks ago. In fact, I took this picture yesterday. We can see we still don't have any grass. So that gives you a sense of it's a, it's a new build. But uh, so looking at the outside of my house, see, here we go. So once you study this for a second, you can see my Ford Focus there sitting in the driveway. I want you to now keep your, your smartphones out again. Pull those out. You're going to use them a couple times today. Pull them out if you can, or do that full left thing. My question for you is what color is my sofa? <laughs> a couple of options there. What color is my sofa? Okay, here I'll go back. Here, I'll show you the picture one more time, and I'll come back so you can see the numbers, okay? Here we go. Here's, the, here's my house, front of my house. What color is my sofa? All right, so I think, I, think we've, uh, I think we've made our point here. Indeed, my, my sofa is brown. In fact, we have more than one sofa, and they're all various shades of brown or beige. Now, here's my question for you. All I did was I showed you a picture of my house. What kind of information did you use to decide that my sofa was brown? What's that? The color of your house. Yeah, the house is, I noticed actually just now the house was a bit overly brown, wasn't it? I hadn't noticed that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Fair enough. So that, that's one clue. What else, what other information would you use? Yeah, couches are usually brown. We know that, at least as far as I know, in North America anyway, I think probably the most popular, popular color for a sofa, I'm sure, is brown. So there's a bit of a cultural bias there, indeed. What other information would you use, do you think? You mentioned the color of my house. Somebody, you, you looked at it, you saw, it's not like my front door was bright green, or I didn't have, you know, eccentric decorations all over it or anything like that. Fairly conservative from the looks of things, so chances are I'm not a fairly conservative color. In fact, you're looking at me right now, fairly conservatively dressed uh, as far as colors go. So you're using all this information to try and really get a sense of what's happening inside, right? The best you can do, the best I've given you, is a whole bunch of just observable things that you can see from the outside. It would have been, of course, much easier had you been able to go up and look in the window and you could have seen what color the sofa was, but I didn't give you that opportunity. So in many ways, this is the same thing we're doing with pain. 
when we're trying to assess and understand a patient's pain. We can't look inside, in fact, as far as we know, at least as of right now, there really isn't a gold standard for pain. Even if I was able to look inside, even if I was able to pop your head into a magnet or into a functional MRI and I was to poke your toes or poke your back with a little poker and look at what parts of your brain lit up, that's only telling me a portion of what's happening as far as your pain experience. That isn't giving me the experience that you are feeling right now. We don't have a gold standard for pain. What we do try and do is use all the information available to us, looking at the way the person behaves, uh, listen to what they say, look at how they rate on our little scales, look at the way they move, to try and understand what's happening on the inside. So I think this is a nice little analogy from trying to understand that. Okay. Now, some of you will have seen this before and know the answer here. So for that, for those people, I say, zip it, don't give it away. <laughs> some of you will have not. This is a perceptual exercise. It's meant to tax your ability to observe uh, things and chop out other things. What we've got here are six players. Uh, we've got three who are in white shirts and three who are in black shirts. The task is to count how many times the players in just the white shirts pass the ball to each other. And of course, they're going to be shuffling around and moving around. There's going to be a lot of activity. Your task is to see, is to count how many times just those players in the white shirts pass the ball. Okay? I'm going to ask you afterwards, and actually it's interesting, it's been shown there's a bit of a gender bias here too. So unfortunately, we have relatively few males compared to females, but let's... Come on, guys, I need you to really help me out on this. Let's see if we can do this. So here we go. All right. Once again, we're going to count how many times the players in white shirts pass the ball as soon as I press play. One, two, three, and go. Yeah. Uh, give me a couple, a couple of guys here first of all. 17. 17. All right. What about the gals? What did we hit? What did we hit? I did not stop going off on 17. <laughs> any other any other choices there? All right. Good enough. For those who hadn't seen this before, did you notice anything else a bit strange there? What did you see? Well, I've seen it before. <laughs> <laughs> who, hasn't, who hasn't done this task before? All right. Did you guys notice anything? No. All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play it one more time. This time, don't worry about counting the, the passes, OK? I'm just going to watch it one more time. Just, just watch the scene. Don't worry about counting the passes. going on. And in doing so, you've actually gotten really good, those who hadn't seen this before, at walking out all the extraneous information. I would say that oftentimes we end up doing this in clinic. Someone comes in and they're complaining about back pain or neck pain or something like that, and immediately I focus in on that, you know, fifth and or, uh, fourth and fifth, you know, lumbar vertebrae or fifth and sixth cervical facet joint, something like that, and I start looking at that and get my hands on there. I want to move that around. I want to see how they move. I want to ask them about that particular area. My focus becomes razor sharp to that. What I hope this kind of exercise will show you, however, is that you can miss a lot of important things 
if you focus too early on just what you think is happening. That sometimes it's worth our while to step back, look at the person in front of us as a human being who has their own um, set of life experiences, their own uh, memories, their own expectations, uh, they've assigned meaning to this whole experience, and try and understand all of these things before we jump in there and start you know, wiggling these joints or whatever it is that we do in our profession.